The Man Who Fought With God, The Extraordinary Saga of Jacob, a fascinating account that remains one of the greatest stories told in the pages of the Bible. This narrative is not just the chronicle of a life filled with challenges, deceit and personal quests, but also a deep reflection on the essence of faith, human struggle and spiritual transformation. Jacob's life serves as a mirror to our own journeys, revealing how the moments of greatest adversity can become the pillars for a true encounter with the divine. From his birth, marked by the premonition of a life of rivalries, to the iconic struggle in the dimness of the night, where he faces not just a physical adversary, but the very essence of his soul. If this type of content about the teachings of the Bible interests you, I ask for your support with your subscription, and don't forget to activate the bell, so you won't miss any of our upcoming videos. Jacob is first mentioned in the Bible, in Genesis 25. When Rebekah, Jacob's mother, was pregnant with him and his twin brother Esau, she asked God why her two babies were fighting in her womb. God replied that the animosity between the two brothers foreshadowed the two nations that would come from them. Jacob would be the ancestor of Israel and Esau of Edom, according to Genesis 36. Moreover, Esau, the older brother, would become the servant of Jacob, the younger brother, according to Genesis 25, verse 23. Genesis 25 is the account of the lineage of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Paddan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out, with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was sixty years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skilled hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob preferred to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob's character is portrayed in the Bible as associated with deceit and trickery from his birth until his struggle with God in Genesis 32, verses 24 to 29. Jacob's most infamous deceptions were committed against his twin brother Esau in exchange for his birthright as the eldest son, which was a double portion of his father Isaac's inheritance. Jacob offered his hungry brother a bowl of soup, according to Genesis 25, verses 29 to 34. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, First sell me your birthright. Esau said, Look, I am about to die. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Moreover, Jacob deprived Esau of his father's blessing, which Esau was entitled to receive, according to Genesis 27 verses 1 to 29. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he replied. Isaac said, I am now an old man and do not know the day of my death. 
Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat, so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, Rebecca was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau went out to the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father speaking to your brother Esau, saying, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go to the flock and bring me two young goats, so I can prepare some tasty food for your father, just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat, so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, But my brother Esau is a hairy man while I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food, just the way his father liked it. Then Rebecca took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins. Then she handed to her son, Jacob, the tasty food and the bread she had made. He went to his father and said, My father. Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau, so he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son, Esau? he asked. I am, he replied. Then he said, My son, bring me some of your game to eat, so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him, and he ate. He also brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac smelled the clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. Cursed be those who curse you and blessed be those who bless you. This resulted in Esau wanting to kill his younger brother, so Jacob fled. On the way to his mother's homeland, he saw angels and a ladder to heaven. When Jacob arrives in Haran, he meets his match in the form of his uncle Laban, Genesis 29. So Jacob went on his way and came to the land of the eastern peoples, near Haran. As he looked, he saw a well in the field, and three flocks of sheep lying there beside it, because the flocks were watered from that well. The stone over the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone away from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and then return the stone to its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob asked them, My brothers, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. Then he asked, do you know Laban, Nahor's grandson, Abraham's brother? And they replied, We do. And he asked, Is he well? And they said, He is well. Look, here comes his daughter Rachel with the sheep. Jacob said, Look, the sun is still high in the sky. It's too early to gather the flocks in their pens for the night. Water the sheep and go and return them to pasture. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered and the shepherds roll the stone from the well's mouth. Then we will water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, 
for she was a shepherdess. When Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and Laban's sheep, he went over, rolled the stone from the well's mouth, and watered the flock of Laban, his uncle. Then Jacob kissed Rachel in greeting, and raised his voice, and wept. Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative, the son of Rebekah, and she ran and told her father. When Laban heard about the arrival of Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him, embraced him, kissed him, and brought him to his house. Then he told Laban all these things. When Laban said to him, You are my bone and my flesh, and Jacob stayed with him for a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Just because you are my relative, should you work for me for free? Tell me what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you as a hired worker for seven years in exchange for the privilege of marrying Rachel, your younger daughter. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you in marriage than to another man. Stay and work with me. So Jacob served Laban for seven years to earn the right to marry Rachel. But they seemed like only a few days to him because of his love for her. Finally, Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my time of service is completed, so that I may take her as my wife. Then Laban gathered all the men of the place and prepared a wedding feast with wine. But at night he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob consummated the marriage with her. Laban also gave Zilpah, his servant, to his daughter Leah as a servant. But in the morning when Jacob woke up, it was Leah who was with him, and he said to Laban, What have you done to me? Did I not serve you for seven years for Rachel? Why have you deceived me and treated me this way? But Laban only said, It is not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Finish the wedding week with Leah, then we will also give you Rachel, and in return you will work for me for another seven years. So Jacob agreed and completed Leah's wedding week. Afterwards, Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a second wife. Laban also gave Bilhah, his servant, to his daughter Rachel as a servant. Thus, Jacob consummated his marriage and lived with Rachel as his wife, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served Laban for another seven years. Despite his feelings for Laban's younger daughter Rachel, Jacob was deceived into marrying her older sister Leah. Jacob, however, persevered and eventually was able to marry the object of his affections. Jacob worked for Laban for many years. Jacob was able to take a good portion of Laban's flock for himself, thanks to God's protection and Jacob's own cleverness. Finally, God told Jacob to return to his father's land. The problem was that this meant Jacob would have to face Esau. Would his brother's anger remain unquenched after all these years? Knowing the story of Jacob means knowing that his life was full of ups and downs. Despite God's promise to Jacob that through him would come not just a great nation, but a set of nations. He was a fearful and anxious man. Jacob was about to meet his brother Esau, who had sworn to kill him at a critical moment in his life. All of Jacob's efforts and fears were about to come to fruition. Jacob had fled from an enraged Laban, only to face his furious brother Esau, eager for his life. Jacob concocted a bribe and then sent a caravan of gifts across the Jabbok River with his women and children, hoping to appease his brother. He was stripped of all his worldly possessions because he was physically exhausted, alone in the wild wilderness and facing certain death. In reality, he had no control over his fate. On the banks of the Jabbok River, he fell into a deep sleep, with his father-in-law behind him and Esau in front of him, too exhausted to fight. But it was then that his real struggle began. Running from his family history had been hard enough. Wrestling with God himself was a completely different matter. That night, Jacob was visited by an angelic stranger. Genesis 33, verse 22. That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. 
Jacob had been wrestling all his life. Even at the moment of his birth, he was in conflict with Esau. Later, he clashed with Laban. Yet just before meeting Esau, Jacob went through the toughest moment of his life. He, who once had grabbed his brother's heel, was now clinging to the physical form of God himself. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as they wrestled. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Note that Jacob is 79 years old at this point in the narrative. As a result, it is unlikely he poses a physical challenge to an angel, although there is no reason to doubt that a physical confrontation took place. We should not confuse this with the main point. When the text tells us that Jacob's opponent could not defeat him, it is not suggesting that Jacob is physically overpowering the man. The ease with which he inflicts physical harm on Jacob indicates that any inability must be in the spiritual realm, not the physical. If the wrestler cannot defeat Jacob spiritually, it is because Jacob is unwilling to yield. Only when the man threatens to leave without offering assurances of God's assistance does Jacob show his willingness to negotiate over critical issues. The turning point occurs when Jacob informs the stranger that he will not let him go unless such assurances are provided. This, I believe, indicates Jacob's willingness to submit to God's demands on him. Jacob's perseverance is now working in his favor. He is willing to go to the end. The blessing manifests in the form of a name change. This is significant for Jacob, as his name had become synonymous with his character throughout history. A name change, therefore, denotes a character change. Changing someone's name was a way to exercise authority over that person. Jacob accepts the name change, which is equivalent to accepting a character change. In this case, the new name is intended to represent the transformation of one of Jacob's traditional strengths. His perseverance has brought him success in his interactions with people, and now it is responsible for his success in his struggle with God, not because God surrendered, but because Jacob yielded. As is customary with God, one must first lose in order to win. Jacob's request for the wrestler's name might be a last effort to maintain control, but the wrestler refuses. Who exactly is this stranger? Throughout the episode, the narrator refers to him as a man, at the end of the episode as Elohim. The man injures Jacob's hip, but he refuses to let him go until the man blesses him. Jacob realized that he was not wrestling with a man, but with God, and he would not let go until he was blessed. The location of the struggle is named Peniel, which means face of God in Hebrew. Here are the lessons from Jacob's struggle with God. First, we need forgiveness, and it only comes through God's mercy. Jacob was responsible for what he did to Esau, and he knew it. Jacob had relied on his own cleverness for success up to that point, but now he did not know what would happen. His survival depended on his brother's forgiveness for his wrongdoings. Although Jacob had no control over his brother's heart, there was someone who did. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until dawn. Genesis 32, verse 24. It was time for Jacob to realize that he could no longer rely on his own strength. He had no control over the forgiveness necessary for survival. If we are to follow God, we must first admit our faults and weaknesses. Only God's mercy can forgive us, and only God's grace can carry us to the other side of the night. Second, God honors perseverance, especially in our pursuit of Him. 
When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as they wrestled. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Genesis 32 verses 25 and 26. Jacob possessed two admirable characteristics, one of them being spiritual sensitivity. This was seen when he fled from his brother and saw the ladder to heaven, and again when he obeyed the Lord's voice, telling him to return to his homeland. His perseverance is exemplified in his pursuit of Rachel and his patience in serving Laban to win her hand in marriage. In his struggle with the mysterious man, Jacob exemplifies both qualities. He recognized that he was wrestling with God and refused to give up until God blessed him. What made this even more powerful were the moral ramifications Jacob was facing. He did not deserve the blessing, but he was willing to accept any judgment or consequence that came with it. The ramifications were not insignificant. The struggle had left him crippled, but Jacob had his blessing. Third, our identity is in Christ. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Genesis 32 verses 27 and 28. Jacob came from an interesting family. He was descended from those who would multiply into many nations through his grandfather's faith. He inherited a bit of his grandmother Sarah's envy, a bit of his mother's cunning sense of humor, and a bit of his father's loyalty. He was named Supplanter at birth and lived up to it. Jacob was a selfish man in his early years. Jacob is partly changed by his love for Rachel and his loyalty to her family, but it is in his struggle with God that he reaches a turning point. He is baptized as Israel, God's prince. What does it mean to have a new name? It's a new persona. Throughout the Bible, God does this numerous times. Every new believer receives the same treatment from Jesus. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 17. As we continue reading Genesis, we see Jacob's name changing back and forth from his old to his new throughout his life. God reminds Jacob of his new name once more in Genesis 35 verse 10. This is something that often happens to us. God calls us his beloved, a new creation in him, but we forget who we are. We must cling to our new identity after we have wrestled with God. We may make mistakes and lose sight of who we are, but we can always return to what God has called us to be. God wants us to know him intimately, and Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. And he said, Why do you ask my name? And there he blessed him, Genesis 32 verse 29. Jacob understood who God was. He knew that God was the God of his father and grandfather. However, the God with whom Jacob wrestled through the Jabbok was God in the form of man. God became the God of Jacob's heart. During the struggle, many people are aware of God, but have never had a genuine and transformative encounter with him. Understanding what God has done for others is not the same as understanding what he has done for you. God is much more concerned with the state of our hearts than how successfully we appear to live a righteous life. Spending time with God is the only way to have a relationship with Him. Reading the Bible, praying and worshipping with our hearts and minds, fully focused on God, brings us closer to His presence. The biggest obstacle to spending time with God is sometimes ourselves. Our priorities get mixed up. I know that starting my day by spending time in God's Word and or praying makes the rest of the day go more smoothly. The events of my day don't change, but my attitude changes because God's peace is with me. Closeness to God requires humility. The sun was rising on him as he passed Peniel, and he limped because of his hip, Genesis 32 verse 31. This physical incapacity was a sign of his new humility for the proud, self-sufficient, and quick-thinking Jacob. Merriam-Webster defines humility as freedom from pride or arrogance. In today's world, humility seems to be anti-cultural and anti-success. In God's world, however, we become better people when we put our pride aside and trust in Him. God humbled many biblical figures, including Jacob, 
Similar stories can be found in the conversion of Simon Peter and of Saul to Paul. Indeed, Paul would later write about a thorn in his flesh. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 2 Corinthians 12 verses 7 to 10 No one would like to go through life with a disability or illness to stay humble, but God knows what we need, and that our dependence on Him, rather than on ourselves, is our greatest strength. The sun was rising over Jacob as he limped, he had a new ailment but also a new identity, a new name, and a new intimacy with God. God wants to bless you. When God makes us wrestle with Him for some blessings, it's not because He is reluctant to bless us, even though it may seem that way initially. It's because He has more blessings for us in the struggle than when we don't struggle. Remember that God sought Jacob out for this fight. God was the catalyst. When God appeared, Jacob was consumed by his own anxiety about Esau and his approaching kill squad, and the fight pulled Jacob out of his fear trance and forced him to focus on God. I doubt Jacob wanted or even thought he needed that forced focus initially. I wouldn't be surprised if Jacob had prayed at the start, God, could you get rid of this guy? This is exactly what I don't need right now. But what he discovered was that the struggle was a conduit for God's blessing upon him. The same can be said about us. Keep fighting. What do you really need from God right now? Don't let go of God until He blesses you. In your distress, fear and uncertainty, God will find you. However, He may not find you in the way you expect or desire. Your greatest ally may seem to be your opponent at first, provoking you to fight with Him. If so, keep Jacob in mind. There are countless benefits to struggling. You might not need soft words of comfort, not need time alone with your thoughts, not need sleep, and perhaps not even a healthy hip. What you need is God's favor. When God invites you to wrestle with Him in prayer, it's an invitation to receive His blessing. Stand firm with Him and don't give up. Don't let go of Him until He blesses you. He loves to bless tenacious faith and you will be transformed as a result. Today, like Jacob, we can enter into a relationship with Christ by confessing our sins and declaring God as our Savior and Redeemer. God can give us new life as His children by admitting our brokenness to Him, and we can enter into an eternal relationship with Him, filled with His blessings and good promises for our lives. Through His new name, Israel, Jacob was able to experience a new identity. Similarly, when we meet Christ, we undergo a transformation. Everything changes, our lives, our thoughts, our actions, and so on. We can also learn from Jacob's story that people in the Bible struggled with God in ways that were not just physical. There is nothing wrong with having questions and wanting to know more about the Bible. Christian faith is not blind, but is based on how God has provided for us in the past. We can struggle with Him and still come out with a new identity. Blessings through struggle. Remember what God did when He wrestled with Jacob. Jacob spent the night anticipating Esau's arrival. He was terrified and desperate, but he came out of the night with God's blessing and renewed faith. All our faith-based struggles with God lead to peace. When we need God's comfort, sometimes He sends it in unexpected and even unwanted packages. If necessary, God will make us limp to strengthen our faith. God even inflicted a disabling injury on Jacob. This made Jacob even more vulnerable to Esau, forcing Jacob's faith to rest more fully in God than in himself. If necessary, God will make us limp to strengthen our faith. Ultimately, Jacob's identity was changed as a result of his struggle with God. He was no longer to be remembered as someone who obtained his blessing through deceit. He received God's blessing this time because he prevailed with God through faith. This struggle proved to be a profoundly gracious gift of God's restoration, similar to the gift Jesus gave to Peter. 
allowing him to affirm his love for Jesus as many times as he had denied him. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep, John 21, verses 15 to 17. God was pleased with Jacob's tenacious faith and granted Jacob's request, Hebrews 11, verse 6. When God calls us to wrestle with him, there's always more going on than we realize, and God always uses it to transform us for the better. We celebrate wealth, power, strength, confidence, prestige, and victory in modern times. We disdain and fear weakness, failure, and doubt, though we recognize that vulnerability, fear, discouragement are normal parts of life, we often interpret them as signs of failure or even lack of faith. We also know that naive optimism and the glossy praises of glamour and success are a recipe for discontent and despair in real life. Most of us will be confronted with the cold and hard realism of life sooner or later. Jacob's story brings us back to reality. One of the most read Christian authors, Frederick Buchner, describes Jacob's divine encounter at the Jabbok River as the magnificent defeat of the human soul at the hands of God. We can easily recognize our own elements of struggle in Jacob's story. Fears, darkness, loneliness, vulnerabilities, empty feelings of powerlessness, exhaustion, and incessant pain. Even the Apostle Paul felt discouragement and fear. We were troubled on every side, without were fightings, within were fears. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 5. But in reality, God does not want to abandon us in our trials, fears, and battles in life. In the conflicts of life, we learn that God provides us with a corresponding divine gift. We can only receive the power of conversion and transformation through Him, as well as the gift not just of surrender, but also of freedom, as well as the gifts of endurance, faith, and courage. Finally, Jacob does what we all must do. He confronts his failures, weaknesses, sins, and everything that is hurting him and faces God. Jacob wrestled with God all night long. Only after he had reconciled with God and stopped fighting, realizing he could not go on without him, did he receive God's blessing, Genesis 32, verse 29. This remarkable incident in Jacob's life teaches us that our lives were never meant to be easy. This is especially true when we decide to wrestle with God and His will for our lives on our own. We also learn that as Christians, despite our trials and tribulations, our efforts in this life are never without the presence of God, and His blessing inevitably follows the struggle, which can be messy and chaotic at times. True growth experiences are always accompanied by struggle and pain. Jacob's struggle with God at the Jabbok, that dark night, reminds us of this truth. Though we may oppose God and His will for us, God is indeed very good. As Christians, we can wrestle with him through the loneliness of the night, but his blessing comes at dawn. Genesis 33 verses 1 to 12. Jacob looked up and saw that Esau was coming, and with him 400 men. Then he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. He himself went ahead and bowed to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you? he asked. Jacob answered, These are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the female servants and their children approached and bowed down. After that, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Lastly, Joseph and Rachel came, and they also bowed down. Esau asked, What's the meaning of all these flocks and herds I met? 
to find favor in your eyes, my lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. If I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God, now that you have received me favorably. Please accept the present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted. Then Esau said, Let us be on our way, I'll accompany you. But Jacob said, You know, my lord, that the children are tender, and that I must care for the nursing flocks and herds, for if they are driven hard just one day, all the flocks will die. Please let my lord go on ahead of his servant, and I will move along slowly at the pace of the herds and flocks before me, and according to the endurance of the children, until I come to my lord in Seir. Then Esau said, Please let me leave some of my men with you. But Jacob said, Why do that? Just let me find favor in the eyes of my lord. So Esau turned back that day on his way to Seir. But Jacob traveled to the north to Sukkoth, and built himself a house and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place is called Sukkoth, shelters or booths. When Jacob came from Paddan Aram, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within sight of the city. Then he bought a plot of ground where he pitched his tent from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. There he set up an altar and called it El Elohe Israel. Jacob met his brother Esau after his struggle. Instead of killing him, his brother welcomed him with an embrace and tears of joy. Esau had reconciled with his brother. Jacob was spared death. Esau wanted none of the possessions Jacob offered him, though he accepted them at Jacob's request. He only wanted to be on good terms with his brother. The rest of Jacob's story is not a happy ending. He would end up losing his beloved wife Rachel during childbirth, his favorite son would be sold into slavery after being betrayed by his older brothers. Jacob's life comes to an end in a foreign land. Despite everything, God reminds Jacob that he is with him and that his promises are true, even if he cannot see how they are possible at that moment. If you found this content valuable, I ask for your support with a subscription so you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. Together, we can illuminate more minds and expand our understanding. Which parts of Jacob's story do you identify with when reading about his struggle? Where in your life do you need to ask for forgiveness? Are you seeking a relationship with God with tenacity? How can you draw closer to him while remaining humble? We can grow, have more peace, and be the man or woman God called us to be when we take the lessons God has for us from the stories in his word. Thank you for being here, and may God bless you.